Hi guys, welcome back, and if you're new, welcome. I'm Natasha, and this is my channel, Witchcraft 80. Today, uh, we're gonna go back to basics. So we're gonna talk about um, the circular needle machine, how to get ready for it, and we start with the cast on and cast off method. For now, we are going to talk about just the circular mode. Um, eventually, we will touch base on the flat panels, but for now, let's keep it uh, nice and simple. So, first of all, once you get your machine, uh, my personal advice is just to get ready in the sense that, for one, if you don't have a roll counter, get one. You can either get those that have a magnet, so obviously as while you crank, the magnet um, crosses the metal rod bar, and that will uh, allow the digital counter to count the rows. Or you can have the manual row counter that you would use maybe usually for crocheting or hand knitting. <coughs> so that it's uh, that's a start. Then another piece of advice that I uh, suggest you do is color or do something with these bumpers that are the ones next to your first needle. We talk about first needle being the needle that is different color from the rest. In this case, this is a 40 needle machine centro. This needle is actually marked as number one on the on the barrel here, but in other machines it might be marked as the last one of the of the round. Nonetheless, uh, most of the crafters, me included, would consider this as number one. So this is our always our starting point, and we mark the bumpers so that when you crank you know when your row is coming to an end otherwise it would be difficult to see until you reach the actual uh, yarn feeder once your machine is done you will need uh, some tools that's always handy to have so obviously some sort of scissors to cut your yarn with you will need a crochet hook. The crochet hook can be any size at all. Um, I personally prefer a medium size. This should be, I think, a four and a half, four and a half, five. But you can use bigger. So th this is a five. So that should be probably a four, four and a half. Or you can use smaller. That is absolutely up to you whatever you feel comfortable with. If you never crochet or you're not used to crocheting, usually a medium size, it's easier to work with. Some, uh, most of the central machine will come with their own uh, crochet hook and needles. Mm -hmm. This is not good quality, but I mean, if you don't have one, this is better than nothing. Then you will need uh, a yarn needle, a darning needle. There are many out there that you can get. This is one of those that will come with the machine. These are ones that I prefer to use are metal and they have this um, loop here that makes it, makes it easy to um, thread the yarn through. And another thing that I would advise you always to keep handy is a loom pick. You might never use it, but if you drop a stitch or talk a stitch or need to um, work on putting back your work on the needles, this is handy to have. <coughs> stitch markers. It's uh, you, you can use anything just to mark a stitch, but stitch markers also are handy to, to have. I have a bunch here that I actually made myself 
with polymer clay. So those are the basics and if you're working with a machine that doesn't have a tensioner and you're new to the craft and you don't um you haven't really mastered how to uh be consistent in your tension by hand, you wanna grab one of these, that's the tensioner. So this is your basic toolbox, if you want to call it like this, to work with the knitting machine. Now we need to obviously uh, start our project. So as I said at the beginning, we are uh, working on the tube mode. On the side of any machine that you're using, you will have a wee switch, a wee lever. And that will, depending on if it's up or down, it will determine if the machine is working on the round, so on the tube mode, or on the panel mode. And it's usually, um, what do you call it? You have a T and a P that will show you which one it is on the side. Okay, so we need to cast on. How do you cast on? So for, to start with, the basic cast on, the normal, uh, most common cast on, is this. You grab your working yarn, you grab your yarn, working yarn. You hold the tail end on your right hand. And you loop the yarn in front of your first needle that we said up for me it's the black one here and underneath the hook so, let me come in a little bit more okay so it's in front and under the hook drop the tail Now you start cranking very slowly and the yarn goes at the back of your second needle. Then you move it at the front of your third, making sure that it's underneath the hook. Also, another thing that you need to be careful of is do not pull because the yarn is still very loose and it can be easily pulled off. From the machine as you can see so take your time so we are at our third needle the yarn goes behind the fourth in front and under the hook of the fifth at the back of the sixth in front of the seventh back front and under the hook back, front and under the hook, and this is like that all the way around. You go slow and you weave in front and back your yarn. The tension that I am giving with the hand is just enough to keep the, the yarn that you're having straight i'm not sagging in but i'm not pulling so this is us at the end of this cast on row <coughs> you will always end if you've done it correctly, you will always end at the back of your last needle. So once you're here, you want to insert your yarn in the yarn feeder, making sure it's all the way down. And then put it into the tensioner. 
whichever tension you choose to work with. Considering that the bigger the hole, the looser the tension, but also it needs to um, work with the thickness of the yarn. So if you have a very thin yarn and you're using your biggest, um, your third tension guide here, it will practically give no tension at all. And all the way around, if it's a very thick yarn, then you might want to use the middle of or the third unless you want a very tight tension. But you will um, get the, the just of it when you start working with the yarn. It will come natural to you. This is the cast on. And this is the most common one. And this is the one that, if done directly with the working yarn, it will create a cinched tail edge. I'll show you what I mean now. But before we start, my advice is check that your cast on is correct, meaning that you ended your cast on at the back of your last needle. So that is check number one, correct. But also, If you can see at the back here, you have the yarn, because obviously we skipped every other needle, you have the yarn looping over three needles. And if this is consistent all the way around, then you've done it correctly. So now that you're sure that your cast on is correct, what you need to do is just crank. Meaning turn your handle and start knitting. Now your first row, this is the first row. You never count as a first row the cast on. So this is our first row. You always need to go fairly slow just to give a chance for your machine to get um, in the swing of things. So the, the tension will adjust, the needle will adjust, any friction will disappear. And you keep cranking. So let's say that you want to make a hat. This is the way you will start that project. Okay, now let's say that you crank enough rows uh, for your project. So whatever it is that you're making, you're at the end of it. You need to cast off. So let's assume that we are making a hat. As I said, a hat requires the both ends of your tube to be cinched together. And in order to achieve that, the cast off will be done by picking up all the stitches. And I'll show you now how to do it. 
So you have arrived at the end of your last row. Release the working yarn, making sure that the last needle is knitting. Now we need enough tail to pick up all the stitches and a rule of thumb to gauge how much yarn you need is to just loosely loop it around the machine like this and as long as it goes around at least one time you're good to go if you want to give yourself one and a half just to make sure absolutely fine but if you're loose enough so this is going around once and a bit and it's very loose so this will be more than enough for me to pick up the stitches so i cut the yarn from the ball now what you need is your needle there are many other different needles out there there are the ones that have the the point that's uh, curved whatever you would like to use i just like to use something that has a thin point to it because what we need to do now is thread the yarn Make sure that no other needles are knitting this yarn and you start cranking very slowly. Now, what's going to happen is every needle that goes across the yarn feeder that obviously now has no working yarn to knit, it will, um, the stitch here will become a live stitch meaning that if i was to take this one off without securing it it will become a drop stitch let's zoom in a little bit okay so the way i like to do it especially at the very beginning when i wasn't uh, that much experienced but I, I still prefer to do it this way is to crank without working yarn until i have two or three needles completely down and the stitch is completely live that will allow me to go inside between the two teeth with my needle and pick up the stitch thread your yarn through it and repeat Then once you've picked up those stitches, you crank some more to release and make them live another two, three stitches. And the reason why I'm doing this this way is because it will prevent any other stitch to drop. Because I only need to worry about the ones is two three that i made live everything else it's been held by the needles and here where the needle is nowhere i mean it's underneath is still uh, a secured stitch so it, it, it doesn't matter if this was to drop on this side instead that will become a drop stitch that will unravel up to the very end and you don't want to do that unless the pattern requires that to do
once you have a bunch of stitches removed from your machine and you feel comfortable enough you can even start cranking and picking crank and pick but again these are things that you will get with practice I mean it's not rocket science but your muscle you need to build your muscle memory I remember me trying at the very beginning of my journey and um, I needed really to take it slow because my hands I was not used to working with my left hand I wasn't steady my needle keeps slipping and things like that silly things like that so if you're completely new just take your time and you can do it this way if you have come across other videos from other crafters that they will just crank a full round and then start in picking up the stitches from the left of the yarn feeder that's okay too I just don't like it because it's it's increasing the risk of anything dropping so again that's it's your choice how you confident you are how practiced you are and there is no really right or wrong way to do it as long as you're able to pick up the stitches then that, that's that's fine whichever way you choose to, to do that it's up to you okay so this is your project of the machine and as i said this will allow you to have a cinched edge so if you pull on both ends you're seeing that they're coming together they're being cinched together and this is the process that you would follow for example if you wanted to make a hat okay Now let's talk about waste yarn. So you might have come across maybe Facebook posts or patterns that talk about casting on with waste yarn. What is that? Is it any different? No, it's not. So the cast on and uh, the, the starting point the cast on is exactly the same so you weave in and out as you did the only difference is that you're starting that process with a contrasting color of yarn that will not be part of your main project because it will be then removed and put aside as a waste hence the name So why would you use waste yarn? Waste yarn usually is used in those projects that require a straight, flat edge um, to be made. So I'm going to show you now an example. And with this example, I will also give you a, a little a little tip or trick, if you want to call it that way. This trick is something that um, most of us know about, but not many of us use. 
And I think it's just for the simple reason that we forget. Although it, it's a useful one. So let's start again. Let's assume that now this that I'm using, this blue color of yarn, is my waist yarn. So once again, I position my machine with the, my first needle facing me in front of the um, in front of the yarn feeder. Put the yarn in front and under the hook. Drop the tail and start weaving at the back, front, back, front, back, front, all the way around. Remember. This is now waist yarn. When you come across a project that requires waist yarn, my advice is to at least make five rows, five to seven rows at least. Just because you will soon see that you will need to work with your project while your waist yarn is on in order to uh, secure the stitches and if the waist yarn is not enough you might run the risk of unravel your project or um, having a little bit of difficulties handling it so you will never really have a, um, a pattern that will tell you exactly how many rows of waist yarn it will only tell you to use waist yarn so in doubt minimum five to seven rows but if you make more, better. So I finished my cast on. And I start cranking my waist yarn. Always make sure that the waist yarn is a contrasting color from your working yarn. So I've done my how many rows of waist yarn that I want to do. Cut the yarn, put it inside, and it's always in between your last and the first needle. Now I'm going to show you this uh, this part without the trick. And then when we are doing the the other side, I'll show you the trick so you can see both ways. So you're doing the, the waist yarn. You've done how many rows you are happy with. Cut the yarn, put it in between your last and first needle. Now you grab your working yarn, as I said, it needs to be a color that's different, it's contrasting, that you need to see the difference when they are side by side, and you will see why in a moment. So, 
this tan color here this is my working yarn and from now you start counting the rows of your project so if your project requires to cast on with waste yarn and we did and then crank i don't know 10 rows now is the moment that you start counting 10 rows and always feed the working yarn next your waist yarn always in between your last and first when you get back around on your first row it's always handy to just hold on to these two tails just to keep a nice tension after that you can just forget about them and you crank Now, you always want to make sure that uh, you finish your round again at the last needle. I'm going to cut my working yarn and put it inside. So, whatever pattern you're, you're following, it tells you to cast on with waist yarn. We did crank how many rows of your working yarn you did and now it's telling you to cast off with waist yarn and now i'm going to show you the trick and you will see the difference once we release this uh project from the machine the trick requires a third color of yarn that is contrasting from your working yarn and from your waist yarn color. You need to be able to recognize that. So I'm going to use this pink one. Once again, I'm going to feed it in between my last and first, and I'm going to crank one row, only one row. And I'm going to make sure that I'm finishing at my last needle before starting a new row. So make sure you're not closing the circle. And now you can get back your waist yarn. That could be any color as long as it's different from your working yarn and this thick yarn. Again, you feed it in between.
Now, remember that so far I always told you to finish your round at your last needle before your first. When you're casting off with waist yarn and you're at the very end, it doesn't matter anymore because what happens is this. If you keep cranking, but obviously once you've done how many rows you're happy with with yarn, cut the yarn from the ball, or if you're using whatever is left from the ball, keep cranking until you are actually at, at the end of your tail. Now it so happened that it actually ended at my last, last needle, but that doesn't it doesn't matter. It could have ended here, here, anywhere. Because now I'm gonna keep cranking with no no working yarn, nothing. And the project will fall. Creating all these loose loops. All these live stitches these are the same that in the example uh, in the first example we picked up with the needle but since this is waste yarn and we need to then remove it we don't really care now what I've advised you to do is if you don't have enough rows of waste yarn or if you know that you're gonna handle this project a lot maybe it's best to do one last row picking up those stitches even though it's waist yarn because that will secure those and i will avoid this from happening so me just handling this for a couple of seconds it's already dropping stitches i'm not too worried about it because obviously it's waist yarn but at the same time, if we keep on going, this will just unravel all the way down. And you don't want that. Okay, so let's say that you are doing a scarf. And it's one of those that has a flat edge on both sides. So this is what you would do. You would start with waist yarn crank how many rows the project requires with working yarn and cast off with waist yarn and in order to complete the project and then be able to remove the waist yarn you need to secure the edges you need to secure the stitches you cannot remove the waist yarn as is because you will just create um live stitches that will just unravel on you so how do you secure uh, the edges the most common way of doing it is to braid the loops the stitches of your working yarn with one another okay Position your work in a way that your tails are on your left. Then locate the tail from the working yarn. If you look close enough, let me grab here you have the loop of your working yarn. This is a good moment even to grab some stitch markers if you wanted to. Just because it will make it easier to locate 
those stitches once you get to the very end. Depending on how flexible the yarn that you're working with is, those stitches might, um, let's say, might disappear on you because they will get so tight that by the time you get to them, you, you might not be able to see them. And if you don't see them and you're not securing them, then you'll drop them. So once you have pinpointed the stitch that's closest to your tail of your working yarn and the one right above it, so from this to this, there is no other stitch. Now you can count how many stitches you need to get to the other half. We've been using a 40 pin machine, meaning that one side, it will be made of 20 stitches. So well, now I'm gonna count 20 stitches to find my half. So this is my 20th. This is my half. Now, where the edge is naturally curling on itself, that helps. But what you need to do is make sure that you have this row is the very last row of your working yarn color of all stitches on the edge and try to put it the in a way that you have one stitch at the bottom and one stitch at the top right opposite to each other it's just easier because what you're going to do is this you grab your crochet hook and you insert your crochet hook inside your first stitch closest to you then you insert the crochet hook in the stitch right above. Now you pull the stitch that's right above, the one closest to the hook, you pull it through the other one. Now you're left with one loop on your hook and this loop belongs to the top row, let's call it the top row. So now you need to pick from the bottom row, and this is when you start alternating. So you pick from the bottom row and you pull through. Now you pick a stitch from the top row and you pull through. Now you pick from the bottom and you pull through. Pick from the top and you pull through. Take your time, especially if you never crocheted before. Just take your time. Make sure that whenever you're feeding the hook inside the stitches, you're not splitting anything and you're not grabbing the waist yarn either. So it's one inside the other, alternating from top and bottom. And depends on how elastic is the yarn, how flexible is the yarn, this is can be a very easy process. Just take your time.
We are getting to the end. Again. And this is the moment where these stitch markers come in handy. You can remove those now. And to finish off, now you grab the tail and you pull it through your last loop. You pull and that creates a wee knot. You now need to remove your waist yarn. Now, this is the cast on edge. If you remember before, I was talking about how easy it is to unravel the cast off edge because it, have all, it has all live stitches. The cast on edge doesn't. So it doesn't unravel on you. So in order to remove this without having this trick here that I'm gonna show you in a minute, what you need to do is you need to locate the very first strand. So try to straighten the the fold and locate the first strand. And it's the strand that if you pull it slides within these loops. I hope you can see it, right? So what you want to do is grab that strand close to the tail and pull. And you're pulling the tail out. Then go a little bit further, locate that first strand and pull. So that the tail comes out. Spin your work around, go a little bit further, and pull. And the reason why I'm not pulling once from the back is because it would cinch. It, it would have difficulties to just slide out. So a few stitches here and there just to remove the first row. it around now you see they will naturally start to unravel so grab that loose end and now you can just pull and it will unravel and this is how you take off the waist yarn if you have not um used the wee trick that i'm going to show you now Bear in mind, if this was the cast off edge, you would have just started to pull and unravel the project. But either way, this is how you remove the waste yarn. Let's check that we haven't missed anything. All good. And this is how you close with a braided edge. Let's do the other side. Same principle. I still need to locate the row of stitches made by my working yarn. So my working yarn is this tan color here. So I'm going to locate that very last row. Now I need to locate my very first stitch. On the cast on edge, on that edge, my very first stitch was beside the tail end. In this case, it's at the top. See if I can show you better. So this is your 
second with yarn. This is your working yarn. And if I pull, this is the loop that it's pulling onto. That's the loop that I need to take care of. So I'm gonna put a stitch marker. And on the other side is the stitch where the waist yarn, in this case, is the pink yarn, is coming out from. This one here. Now what we need to do is count 20 stitches in order to find our half, half section. So from stitch number one that's already marked. This is my 20th. Once again, I slide my crochet hook inside i go right at the top of that slide inside the stitch that's above and pull that last stitch through the first one now i pick the one next well nearest to me and i pull that one through then i go at the top edge grab the stitch and pull that one through and i alternate from one from the top and one from the bottom i'm taking my time i'm making sure that i am not grabbing any waste yarn and i am not splitting any um i'm not splitting my my stitches my yarn I can remove the stitch markers. And pull this through. Do not pull too hard yet, because we're gonna check if we missed anything. If we did, it's easier to just untie this and pick up the stitch. But before doing that, we need to remove the waist yarn. So, as I said, if this was not, if I didn't use this uh, pink yarn as a trick, 
what I would do is I would locate the tail of my waist yarn. It'd be here somewhere. Here it is. And just pull on it and this will unravel. As soon as we have our wee trick that can be used at the uh, cast on edge as well as the cast off as we did. What I do is I'm going to help myself with a needle, a loom pick, anything like that, just to pull away a couple of stitches from the start. It just helps. Okay, so once you have released a couple of stitches just at the beginning, what you're going to do is you're going to grab one of the ends, hold your project, and pull. Okay, now the reason why I did that and I intentionally broke the yarn is because somehow I split the yarn here. So obviously it was not pulling through uh, smoothly, but if you don't split the yarn like I did, it will just come out in one go. And you don't have to worry about unraveling um, your waist yarn. So I wanted to show you that because it's just an option. Um, as I said, especially when you have a bulky amount of waste yarn that you need to deal with, or many parts of a project that all require waste yarn, it's just quicker. That's all it is. So here I don't see that we missed anything, so we can tie a knot. And this is your finished project. Then you would hide the tails, cut the, the excess, and keep on with your project. So, just to recap the cast on, the most common cast on, it's always done the same. So, you weave in and out your yarn within the pegs, starting from the first one, loop it in front, under the hook, and then it's back and front, back and front, until you close the circle. Once you reach your last peg, you always need to finish at the back of that one. And that very first row of cast on is never counted as the overall rows of your project. Casting on directly with working yarn will provide you a cinched edge. And that is normally used for hats or anything that will require an edge to be cinched. Whenever the pattern is asking you to cast on with waist yarn, it means that you're using a color of yarn that's different from your main color. 
the cast on is exactly the same but this is yarn that you will not be using within your project this only allows you to close your project flat and have a flat edge so i hope this is clear obviously there are other um reasons why you would use waste yarn but those are might be more um advanced techniques so once you master this anything else will come uh automatically okay so this is all for this uh first lesson i hope it was clear i hope uh you enjoyed it and if you have any questions please drop a comment below i will get back to you right away um and yeah that's it so thank you for watching thank you for making it this far uh, there are other uh, videos of the Back to Basics series coming up soon. So subscribe, hit the bell button so you get notified whenever those are up and running. Thank you again, guys, and have a good rest of your day. Bye.